And I think, you know, AI is a really good way of, of bringing that back, getting that lifeblood back into things and, and saying to people, you don't have to worry about the guys with the money. You don't have to worry about attracting a massive audience. Just do what you feel in your bones and your heart that you want to make. Hello and, and welcome to one more episode of Zero One Cast, uh, a place where humans create and machines dream. Uh, today we have the legendary, I would say, Uncanny Harry, also known as Ryan Phillips. Uh, we had a very nice conversation of him. He's someone who's working on the mainstream industry. He works, works as, on the BBC. Uh, yeah, we, we, we've been to many topics, also talking about how AI would join mainstream and many other uh, directions of our conversations took out. So Mauricio, what's your thoughts about the conversation? How did you like it? Yeah, Ryan is an awesome guy also, dude. We have so much experience in the industry and yet can keep itself so up to new things and, and adopting new things in a still innovative way. So it's, it's always fresh to see someone that has so many experience, always be innovating himself and creating new things. He said he has 40 years of ideas to produce now, which is, is awesome. And yeah, hope you all, all like it. Okay, so let's go for the episode. Hello and welcome to one more episode of Zero One Cast. Uh, today we have here with us the legendary, I would say, early adopter, Uncanny Harry. Uh, yeah, been following uh, his work for, for more than a year, I believe. Uh, we were really looking forward for this conversation here. I'm here also with Mauricio, our creative partner on Zero One Scene and my co-anchor on this podcast. Uh, we are having many interesting conversations with people from this community, and we hope you enjoy as much as we do. Uh, so, man, let's start. Can so maybe uh, Ryan, can you can you tell a little bit about yourself? Some some short intro for people who don't know your work yet. Uh, yeah, tell me us a bit about about you. So my name's Ryan Phillips. Uh, I've been experimenting with AI film for about two years. Uh, about a year ago, I set up a Twitter account called Uncanny Harry, uh, an anonymous account that I started uh, showing my work in progress with the new tools, and I got onto various features for testing new tools. Uh, so I'm a, a traditional filmmaker and a television director by trade, and I, I just sort of fell into the... First of all, I sort of saw it as playing with a tool an interesting tool like a parlor game for kids you know I, I was playing with um very early in image makers and then quickly it, it i sort of understood that this was going to be more than that so i really started to try and push um what was going on as hard as i could and try and and, and make what i could out of it and i had a great deal of fun doing so for the last year it's been very exciting and it's been very very fast in terms of accelerating from those early experiments with still images to coming up with complete short builds. Great. Yeah, it, it is, this thing goes really fast, right? It's impressive to see even one year, six months, how all this thing change. Uh, so yeah, there is one question which I like to, to ask uh, all the guests first, which basically uh, before talking about AI, uh, talk about uh, Harry before AI, right? And before AI, so like, how, how was your work routine and creative process before AI? And did it change it now? And, and how does it change it? Yeah, so uh, I think because um, because you sort of cling to the old routines, initially you try and retrofit things into those routines. So I was your filmmaker. I was relatively successful. Um, got my film screens internationally, but I sort of hit the plateau when trying to break into features and stuff like that. Quite a small industry in this country, um, and I became very frustrated with the process. So initially, I saw AI filmmaking as a way of, of of doing that. So I tried to sort of treat it in the same way. You know, you write your script, you then uh, storyboard, you then make your coverage, um, shoot your coverage, or generate your coverage. But uh, I think I've sort of organically grown a bit with it now and leaned into the strengths of the AI. So um, that process isn't as well defined because although I like the discipline of traditional filmmaking, 
you don't need to be as disciplined with AI because, you know, that location will always exist for you. You can go back to it any time. You know, uh, that actor, you you can get him any time. You can put him back. Whereas in a traditional sense, you're always concerned about, right, I've got this limited amount of time. I've got no time to experiment. I've got to have a very hard plan because mm-hmm. of budgetary concerns, because of this and that. And so you try and structure it like that. But as I've learned with AI, you can have your plan, but it doesn't have to be so hard fixed. And then you can generate, and then you can look at some of the happy experiments that come with the generations, and you can you can go along with them and allow that to tweak your script a bit, and you know, and get you know what's loosely called performance out of your AI actors. Oh, I like that look. I can alter my dialogue to incorporate it or. So you can lean into the strengths of it, and also you can shoot additional coverage whenever you want to. You know, so if you if you if you if you go into the edit and then you see, oh, actually, I, I could do with a cutaway there, or I could actually do with a bit more, you know, setup here. So you can then go back and generate, which you know you never had the ability, you know, unless you've got a big American budget of saying, I'm in the edit, I haven't got the material, let's get the location, the actors back and go again. So I think it's. It has changed um, from trying to squeeze it into that traditional format. It, it, it is, and it is evolving. You know, with with the the changes that are coming with the AI, with the with the various new technologies that come out. So I'd say it definitely has changed from, from a rigid, you know, traditional filmmaker to something a bit more fluid, much more flexibility, right? And and yeah, control and. Again, yeah, that's what you said. You don't have like, oh, hey, you have five hours to shoot this scene. You need to make it. It kind of it's like you can revisit and save and whatever. That's true. So basically, so this like, I don't know if you remember exactly, but how and, and when did your journey into AI filmmaking begin? Like there was anything inspire you, anything you saw? Uh, like there was any spark? Uh, how, how and when did it started for you? Yeah, so... Uh... I follow a guy named Alex, I think he's a Russian guy who Alexander, who's been doing some early experimenting with um uh, diffusion stuff and had come up with like this arcane. Um and this was about a year and a half ago probably. It's like a, a it's like an early style transfer. So you basically shoot your footage and you smack it on top and it turned it into a sort of anime effect. Very flicky, you know, um very um very lost its consistency quite a lot but it was an early um early example of it and i started to think oh i could use this as a demo to sort of produce uh trailers and ideas and uh, 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 and show it in that way so i was getting pre-existing material or rough mock-ups in mm-hmm. um in after effects and then slapping this stuff over the top and so that was my first step into it and then i thought oh i can use this for character work and i was doing stuff like put in a filter effects on characters and then using very early uh voice um changes ai voice changes which again were really distorted and robotic but i could sort of see oh uh, this has got an idea of where it's going and then uh, nick floats on twitter i don't know if you follow him he's a big mid journey man he put out a competition saying i will pay for a year's subscription of mid journey uh uh if anyone shows me their work and i think it's you know, I think it's worthy of something to support. So I I put in one of these early pieces that I've been experimented with and it won the comp and he paid for the year of mid journey. So that was my first you know, I'd messed around with mid journey, but I hadn't um I hadn't really done anything significant with it. And I've messed around with it a, a few iterations before. I think it was on V five or four then. So it had that big jump at that point. And so I started getting into my journey, made some some of those early videos that, that a lot of us made, which was just like still images on mid journey with pushes in. But I was still doing voice work that there, you know, changing mouse and stuff like that and trying to make a story out of it. But yeah, that was the sort of early first steps into it was uh, sort of a stable division video to video stuff that was really in the early days. And then video journey sort of steals with a bit of animated mouth and at work and a bit of um, After Effects, um, uh, uh, cutting people out and moving them slightly to give some movement in the image. 
yeah, so they were the, they were the sort of first steps into AI filmmaking. Awesome, man. That's quite quite the beginning of the things, you know, <laughs> paving the roads of, of AI filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember the time I was there too, so quite amazing. Change a little bit of, of a subject. You are the lead director on BBC, right? Uh, can you talk a little bit about your life as, as this role on the company, what you do, your responsibilities, what type of work you do in there? So I am a lead director, so I'm responsible for uh, the London uh, Bureau uh, in terms of the directors, uh, director training and outputting the national bulletins and the London uh, London area bulletins. Um, so as you can imagine, through the pandemic, that was quite a, a stressful time um, with a lot of pressure on us. Um, subsequently, I... So I output programs daily, I initiate training programs, I work with uh, the editorial and the creative teams to make production choices about programs, about how we shoot stuff, how we put stuff together. I work on outside broadcasts, so, you know, out in the field as well as in the studio gallery. Um, but more re more recently, I've been working with the automation team, so programming the robots and the automation uh, in in delivering uh, the news effectively, so how the the galleries work by automation, and how the uh, camera systems and all that work work by automation. So it's uh, it's sort of ties in a little bit with the AI stuff, as in it's quite future focused. Automation and AI should be uh, should be guaranteed a job for a little bit longer. <laughs> for sure, one hundred percent, they belong together, right? Uh, on that note. Is, is BBC using AI in any capacity and which is your favorite show that you did in the, in the job? So, um, the BBC is not presently using AI, um, because of the legal ramifications and so on and so forth. What they are doing is in our news bureaus, they're trying to spot, uh, AI manipulated images and we have a, uh, an agency called BBC Verify looks into deep fakes and stuff like that so they try to um they try to address some of the uh manipulation of images and news stories uh by ai uh, the sort of darker side of ai that we're, we're all aware of coming into this uh big election year um but i think like a lot of major uh broadcasters and major studios they are waiting to see what the legal judgments will be about how uh, they can use AI and if they can use AI in what capacity. Um, I know we've got a situation with Adobe that is um, that is uh, uh, guaranteeing the use of their work legally. So you know mm -hmm. they'll 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 front the legal cost if there's any mm -hmm. um, if there's any issue. But I think the BBC wants uh, and many other um, broadcasters will want more. Um, more verification on the both the moral and legal side of AI, and also, you know, certainly in news and stuff like that, there would have to be foreground in that this is AI when they use it, and under what situations can they use it because it's an artificially created image. Mm -hmm. So I think the BBC um, is in a sort of holding mode, as are a lot of uh, mm -hmm. major corporations, and and sort of seeing where this technology is going to go. Um, in terms of my favourite show, uh, I was pleased to be uh, uh, involved with the national news over the pandemic because it part public service broadcasting where we're doing our best to try and provide information, security and reassurance. Um, I was involved in some of the coverage of the Queen's death, which was quite, um, quite a, a, obviously a, a monumental um, time for our, our country. Um, so... Yeah, it's been it's been it's been stressful but rewarding. <laughs> Quite a ride. Yeah, I think the the legal aspect, right, is still uh, something that is really concerning and yeah, delicate for many uh, big companies to use. I, I totally understand that, and I hope this year this will unfold a bit more. We get more more clarity regarding this. Also, right, 
will be nice if they can say wh where this database was trained, which kind of image you, you really use just your own stuff. Did you use image from somewhere else? I think every company, right, is looking for this kind of clarity and uh, to, to use. And of course, I think there will be disclaimers as well. Uh, we can talk about, I think, a bit more on the, later on this topic. But yeah, I also see that maybe big or even like on productions or maybe even TV or something, they will maybe start to add small slices of yes. AI, which will be a disclaimer there. And slowly, maybe this will get like more big or fat in some way. Uh, yeah, I still don't see also like 100% uh, things being doing right now. But yeah, I think we are on, a, on the direction. I think this will become inevitable at some point. Uh, like to use these resources here and there, since it can save a lot of money, a lot of time, like with shooting costs and stuff like that. Um, so let, let's talk about the cold call. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great uh, movie. Uh, congratulations. I was really impressed. Uh, first time I saw, uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, that's one of the reasons also I created the website, right? I was like, hey, this is great. Hey, this guy is good. Oh, this, this guy here is also good. And I say, like, I, I like, let's create a home for this content where people can discover it more easily and stuff like that. So, yeah. So what, what were your, your main inspirations for the cold call? If you had any, maybe a director or a movie. So yeah, tell, tell us a bit more about your inspirations and then the creative process on the, on the cold call. So um, it started off, I was trying to see if I could produce a 3D space with two consistent characters. So I was doing that in mid-journey, and I had these two characters in mind, these two hitmen, and I was creating a space, and I thought, wow, I've actually done it. I've created multiple angles, mm -hmm. and I've created this, this, this 3D environment that looks consistent, and I've created these two characters that look consistent, um, which is a bit of a holy grail at the time of, you know, can we do that? Definitely. Um, and then I thought, well, I've gone to the trouble of doing this. I need to, uh, I need to come up with a, a a story, you know, to support this. And I was a big fan of, of a Pinter play, Harold Pinter, playwright that I studied in university, who did a play called The Dumb Waiter, and it was about it's a two headed play about two um, two hitmen dressed in Reservoir Dogs style suits. So mm -hmm. at the time, you know, Reservoir Dogs was all the rage. So we thought it was super cool. And they're waiting for a dumb waiter. So it's basically an old um, little mini lift that stuff would come down in, you know. So in rich houses, you'd mm -hmm. have them send up the wine in these little mini lift, a dumb waiter as such. And they're getting information from people upstairs for this dumb waiter. And I really like that idea because I thought I've got my two, my two people. And so um, I also like, you know, I loved as most people in my generation did Pulp Fiction, the fact that they had two people talking about irreverent stuff, you know, about cheeseburgers and, you know, you're so used to seeing Hitman be these one-dimensional figures of like, you know... Evil I'm and gonna, grumpy. I'm yes. gonna, exactly. And they're not these rounded individuals that you can believe are real people. So I wanted to incorporate a bit of that in there and also have a nice twist at the end of quite a short, film um and so i just that that was my sort of hook in i was thinking right i need it to be a two-header i love the dumb way to that'll be that right what they're, they're hitmen there's a phone um okay and then i sort of in fact i got some of it from the gem 48 competition although i didn't take part i saw runways uh read out of what what you know the inspiration was and there was a phone and an abandoned warehouse uh -huh. and a gangster is the lead character. So I thought, oh, I can use those. And that sort of spilled me on to uh, the dumb waiter and, and sort of reservoir dogs. And uh, uh, I, I liked, I like uh, the old fashioned British gangster movies like Mona Lisa. Um, uh, it's just a Bob Hoskins uh, film, you know, the sort of gritty eighties and seventies, uh, like get Carter, um, the gangster movie. So I wanted to, Mm -hmm. I wanted to do that because it's different because we we'd all done a lot of space and we'd all done a lot of sci-fi you know, sci-fi and fantasy you know which is which this stuff's really good at and I wanted to do something a bit more mundane mm -hmm. and say can this do you know not only your big Lord of the Rings but can it do your sort of uh you know clerks or can it do your your sort of low budget um uh features that used to come out in the in the 90s and early 2000s 
and it sort of worked. I, I got some sort of performance out of the actors. I was using a very early um, voice to voice, so that was me doing all the voices, and that you know it it sort of it was it was all good enough that it didn't detract from the story. It was just good enough that that people were a lot of people were pulled out and thinking, oh, this looks rubbish. So that was my goal, to get it good enough that you could invest in the story and the characters. And I think I, to a large extent, pulled it off. I mean, a lot of people, you know, this looks like a rubbish computer game and all that, which is fair enough. You know, it is, it's still in the early stages. Uh, I think we're at PlayStation 3 or 4 at the moment. <laughs> yeah, but, we, um, are, we are pushing these tools to their limits, right? I think that's about yeah. this. So. Yeah, and they're, they're, none of that was designed to do that. <laughs> where everyone's kit bashing and smashing, you know, going on GitHub and smashing something together with, you know, Runway or Pika. And uh, 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 so everything's being mashed together. I'm sure at some point this will all be in one, you know, package in the not too distant future. But at the moment, the guys who are doing the best work are, 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 are not only able to tell the stories, but they're also kit bashing with the available tools wherever they are, white papers, you know, runway, stable diffusion, control net. They're just grabbing what they need from the scram bag and smashing it together to get the result they want. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great catch. I think that's the insight you had that, yeah, a lot of people doing sci-fi and stuff, like let's do something more realistic and again the consistency the dialogue i think were great insights uh and yeah also i was yet yeah, trying to help the budapest budapest air film festival with the films and the creation and and he was also telling me hey it's great thanks for the help a lot of great movies are coming like i really appreciate your support but we are needing more documentaries like we don't have many as yeah because not many people are doing ai documentaries and I had even some stats, uh, some small dashboard, and I was saying, you see, like, there is not, and I think this is also, like, something to be explored in some way, uh, like, you know, a fictional documentary format or something like that. Because when you look at even the like, stats, I, I saw, as I said, mostly sci-fi, and yeah, it's, yeah. like, predominant, definitely. So, yeah, cool, man. Let's talk a bit about the workflow and tools. So I, I saw you recently playing a lot with LensGo, uh, the style transfer. I also did some first try two days ago. I like quite interesting, and yeah. Also, Dave Clark recently posted a very nice uh, mix that he did with the green background and the zombie stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We are mentioning Dave, I think, in all the episodes. <laughs> but man, it's because <laughs> you're doing good stuff, so that's why you're mentioned. But he will also come soon for the podcast. But yeah, really was a very interesting experiment just to combine right the style transfer and the and the green screen. So yeah, tell me a bit, like, do you have any like favorite workflow or also tell a bit more about uh, the lens go, how do you playing with it or what, why do you think it's interesting? Yeah. So, uh, I love the image to video stuff because you don't have to do any shooting. <laughs> I mean, that's the big bonus of that is you're not having to pull out a green screen. You're not having to set up stuff. So the image to video is great, but only gets you so far because if you want choreographed movement, it's very hard to get that out of the the unless it's quite small stuff quite basic stuff like someone moving towards something you know you could for instance have someone pick up a gun point it at someone then put it down and shake their fist that it would you'd have to cut away i think you away. also need to be quite close right to the camera to get some nice sharpness or focus and, yeah. yeah i mean that's improved and also the coherency is as you step back the further you get away, faces start to fall apart and, and bodies start to fall apart. Whereas if you're nice and close, the detail the detail can stay. So I think, you know, going forward to make a cinematic whole piece, we need to be thinking about blending image to video stuff as, sorry to name drop David Glenn, as he did with that a piece where he put some real life footage and mixed it in with, um, with some image to video stuff. I think we probably need to be looking at... Um, uh video to video stylization and mixing that with image to video so part of my plan with lens go which is a new style transfer system much like uh gen one uh by runway um and the kyber motion stuff uh kyber video to video stuff um but this is it's got a lot more coherency 
um, I think it's control net based and it, it's really good at holding stuff together. So you saw Dave's stuff with the zombie, you know, it looks really good at holding together and the faces work really well and stick. The problem with it is at present, it doesn't do facial detection. So it's essentially a mask on your face and then you have to animate that with other tools. So it's tricky to get a complete performance out of it. But in terms of, of choreograph action, as you saw with Dave's piece, you know, if you want to shoot a mark or a sword fight, I think that's where we're going to have to be looking at blending that stuff with the image to image. So having a nice establishing shot, you know, on your image to image, if it's blowing over this battleground, your cutaways of the close ups of the two guides you could have on your image to image as they stare at each other, hands on swords, image to image. But when they actually then go for it and start attacking each other, you're probably going to have to make that a video. Uh, to video stylization to get that coherency and that that choreography going on. So that's why I'm starting to try and look, uh, trying to split my time and look at more uh, video to video stylization. Sounds great, man. Sounds great. There's a lot of tools out there, and like, it's interesting how different outcomes they provide and how different they are, they are to operate. I've been playing a lot with. Uh, Conf UI and animate div. I'm getting just some real nice, like real match of like mouth movement and everything with full consistent. Like, yeah, so happy, but it costs so much to get to a place yeah. like this. Like it's so complicated, but it's, it's right, quite, quite interesting. So I'm quite happy to be tapping my, my toes on that. Um, in the beginning of the, the podcast, you said the difference about the traditional filmmaking process and the AI filmmaking process. Uh, that you kind of, it kind of is, is more experimental, right? You kind of adapt with the things that come out from 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 the AI. Uh, do you have any nice story to tell about something that happened that way? Something that completely turned the the, the story to another direction? And if you have any tips on like what types of skills someone should you know groom and, and bloom to to be ready to do this rapid adaptation in the middle of a process while you're producing a movie. Yeah. So, uh, in, um, in, uh, the cold call, I was generating the footage. Uh, I sort of had a new script, but it was nothing firm. You know, he's going to sort of say this, he's going to sort of say that. And I put a man smiling and one of the characters laughed. I got a laugh out of him and I thought, Oh, right. I can, I can get a laugh, you know? So then I then thought, right, let's make this bit a junk and that breaks the ice. You know, there's something coming cold and, and you're not too sure what their relationship is. Are they, you know, are they friends or their enemies? And there's this icebreaker of a joke where they laugh and then everyone relaxes and really, that tension drops away. And yeah, because I, I thought, I, I thought uh, I'd never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen a change of emotions. Everyone's quite robotic previously. So that was a real like, oh, I, I can I can do this. So that made me change the script and that made me then start from med laughing and get both characters laughing and cutting away and then doing the voice to voice. And well, can I laugh on the voice to voice? Will it distort? Um, and it did a bit. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'll see if I can get some um, dot laughter and then will that match up? And yeah, so it, it was, it, I love the way that it, that it sort of feels so new, so fresh. I mean, when I was a kid, it's like when computer program first come along, with, uh, and I was a kid buying these games, these you know cassettes that people were making in their bedrooms essentially. And each month, someone would do something new. The graphics would improve, or you know, suddenly you'd have a role playing game, and you'd be like, "Wow!" And it sort of feels that level of um, of uh, of, of of pioneering spirit to all this you know it all feels like fresh snow that we're walking through and leaving our footprints in so it, it it's you know with the films most of it's been done <laughs> you know most of that ground has been well trodden and, and the the beauty in there is finding your own take on things and finding your own way of making that story anew and you know every story's been told but this is a complete new format. And um, I'm loving in the space, like, I don't know if you guys have been following the simulation where they're talking about um, 
uh, created in a fictional San Francisco, populated by yeah, um, side yeah, yeah. So that I was thinking, wow. So you'll be able to make like reality TV out of this. You'll be able to edit it and and say manipulate it a little bit, and you'll have this unreal reality TV out of this. So it, it, it's as well as the happy accidents. I think we're also looking at a evolving process of how we make things. You know, perhaps in the future I'll be able to have a cold call situation, and I'll be able to say. You know, these are the two characters. I'll design those two characters and I'll let them go. And then if I don't like it, I'll just rewind back. Actually, let's tweak it a bit more that way. He's a bit more, you know, as if I'm actually describe. directing it. Yeah. So we'll have improvised, you know, improvised unreal television. Uh, or it will be very, film. very interesting to direct instead of prompt with your voice. Yeah. Right. I never thought about yeah. it. <laughs> so. Yeah. You'll, be, you'll, you'll have these, uh, you know, sort of jackpot type characters that you've made and they'll they'll go on their own and you'll say actually no i like your choice there but let's let's take it a bit more this way you know it'll be weird and how will that how will that directly take place you know i, I doubt it'll be the same as informing an actor or will it will it be the same as the informing actor but yeah a brave new world definitely we are we are we are walking on un un uncharted territories right uh we are all uh, yeah, walking in the dark and exploring, and push, like I said, pushing their tools to their limits, uh, building stuff. And uh, and also one friend, also when I, I created the director's page for him on the website, he said, hey, I look important now. And I say, maybe, maybe one day we will because we are really early adopters of this thing. And again, we are yeah. pushing them. And I, I know we are not doing because of that. We are doing because we enjoy it. But that's why that's what we are doing, right? And, it, and also... Um, I, on my last uh, experiment I did is the DeLorean second-hand advertisement. I used the voice-to-voice -voice from Eleven Labs. Mm -hmm. I was really happy. Uh, yeah, I really good. enjoy because, you know, you can put the mood, you can put the emotion, you can put the intonation. And if you basically don't like your own voice, you can just transform it. But it was really interesting. Like, you know, just generate, I re record my own voice here with my mic on GarageBand. Just put it there, choose some voice. I think I generate like Twice and I was already happy. It was like that. That's what I need. It was really fast uh, and also I, will, I will, for sure I will adopt this to my next projects instead of like just text to voice. I will because then you can read the timing and motion. You know, it was really interesting. And also, other thing I'd like to mention that happened today. Uh, you probably uh, saw we, we, we trained this GPT by right, the filmmaker Pro, and I, yeah. I'm working on the on that 15 minutes uh, movie, which it's. <laughs> impossible so i will break it into three parts otherwise i will never finish and the tools evolve very fast so but basically i i i took a piece of my script which i already had before and i put it there on filmmaker pro today and i say hey can you can you give me some tips or something? how can i improve this and i was quite surprised uh it was like he was not rewriting my script he was just say hey maybe here you can put more description about the environment uh, or here, maybe you can put more deepness to the conversation or some sense. So he, he basically did not rewrote my script, but he really gave me some options to how, how I could improve it and make it deeper or more involving. And I was really impressed with the, with the results. So yeah, I don't know if you had a chance to try, but I like do it because it's, it's better than it, it seems like. <laughs> it's because I trained it well. <laughs> I'd love to have a go of it. Uh, when I start to write my next script, I'll definitely have a play with it and see if I can uh, uh, get it to help. I'd like you say, I think a lot of people on the outside of the bubble think that the AI makes it all for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 and Prompt they don't movie. Understand. Yeah, <laughs> they don't understand it. it's an assistant. It's a collaborator. It is not the be or one end all at the moment. Um, and talking about the 11 lab scenes, this is part of the pain of being an AI filmmaker as well. I'd finished the cold call and about three days afterwards that came out. And I was like, oh, where were you? You know, and no, when the uh, runway update their engine, I need to remake 19 scenes of this project, 90 scenes of yeah. this project. You know what I mean? It, it, I think to some extent, you just have to close your eyes and go with what you do because otherwise it's moving so fast, you'd be constantly remaking your stuff. And I uh, I was fortunate enough to have Runway's motion brush come out, you know, just a single motion brush right at the end. And there was one shot where I needed a head turn to follow a character and follow him back and a wrap to follow our characters across. So motion brush really helped me out. But 
yeah, the amount of times you kick yourself when you finish a project and something better just drops like yeah. the day after you finished it and you're like, Exactly. That's why I cut this project because things are moving so fast. And it, like when I started, it's already totally different. And you can see, right? You can see the gap. Like runway yeah. is much sharper now. And also, it's like now the multi layer motion brush it also helps. So let's talk. I think we spoke a little about it, but uh, maybe talk a bit more. Uh, like, so AI on the mainstream, right? Like we say, we are indie, we are earlier adopters, we are living on this bubble, which is, I think, is still a bubble. Uh, but how do you see the future of AI on the mainstream and entertainment? Like, how do you see this entering mainstream in any ways, like on your personal perspective? I think the, the, the documentaries are an interesting thing that you talked about. I think there's a, a Billy Holiday documentary coming out, uh, like a mainstream film that's going to use AI to recreate a lot of the, you know, the, the sort of stock footagey type stuff where they're looking back at her because there's not a lot of existing materials. So I think that's a really good idea of how it will be to sort of B-roll and stuff like that help help with visualization for for documentaries. I think advertising, I think it's born for advertising. You know, it's born for pop videos. Uh, the way you can jump styles and you know that you, you're not having to stick to a very traditionally shot linear narrative for either of those forms. You can jump around. You can play with form. You can change form and style. So I think it's going to rapidly, and as soon as there's a green light legally, um, and even when there isn't, I'm sure it's it's already starting to creep into, you know, you saw Kanye's pop video. You will see adverts. There's a few adverts that have started adopting it. So I think it will be, I think, I think in, in the mainstream, everyone's looking to the left and right and seeing who's going first. You know, it's mm -hmm. all very tentative. I think when that starter gun goes off and the the first few make a run for it, I think you will see a race, a race to catch up because the financials of it are just too tempting for, for big organizations. You know, it is just the money saving and also the ability to do stuff at speed and react at speed. You know, you could see, you could have a celebrity say something or do something and the next day have a video which incorporates that bit of history into it. But if you're shooting traditionally, you're talking about at least two weeks, three weeks to deliver that. And by that time, the news cycle has gone. You know, that's not cool anymore. That's not that's not trendy. So I I think initially it will be pop videos and it is already starting to be pop videos and advertisement. And we can see that now creeping in. It's no longer just us guys playing around with it on the internet. It's starting to 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 seep into popular culture through those things. I think then you will see it in the Dave Clark style mixed form stuff. So it's used to, used as uh, supplementary footage for, for films, especially short and independent video makers will be using it because of, you know, uh, cost applications and, and, and the style and delivery you can get at virtually no cost. So they'll be shooting bits of it traditionally and mixing in, you know, AI generated footage to get that lovely drone shot at the beginning or to, you know, get the monster coming out the cupboard or all these sort of things. And then I think it will start to then, you know, become a form within itself. So as an alternative, you know, as a sort of uh, an alternative to mainstream films, I think, you know, a lot of people said Hollywood's dead and going to be swept aside. I don't think that's the, that's the case. I think it, that aspect of it will be a slow takeover. Um, but who knows the speed? I, w I wasn't expecting this to be where we are now. And I consider myself someone who was quite, um, you know, optimistic about the technology and how it will progress. But I think we're getting into a sort of acceleration phase where people are getting better at using the tools and the tools are evolving because people are getting better at using the tools as well as the technology evolving. So it's all... It's like a self-feeding turbine that's getting faster and yeah. faster. There's exponential, um, right? It's it's crazy. Yeah, and you know, there's a couple of big guys like Matt Wolf who've been talking about stuff that's on the horizon they can't talk about because of NDA <laughs> mm -hmm. that sounds like that it's it's blown them away. So we could be looking at, you know, if you think about it, there's only four or five big steps for us to be doing um complete films with AI. There's only, you know, if you could mm -hmm. 
if you could be able to generate um, figures in a 3D space and direct them as we talked about mm -hmm. and then stick a style transfer on them like a stable diffusion but a, a very coherent one then you're there yeah you, you're yeah, actually it, there it's it's you it's, know yeah it's really fast and yeah i totally to and i also like when i see what people are doing with the tools we already have it's already impressive yeah. to be honest like you know yeah. with all the limitations we know they are there like character consistency for example and stuff what what we are doing it's already remarkable i would say yeah i i think the problem we've got is that it's remarkable to us because we know where it's come yes. from and it's remarkable to us because we know how fast it's going and we're impressed in each other with our stuff. Yes. I think when you take it out and put it next to something shot on 35 mil, the, the everyday person in the street go, oh, that doesn't look as good as that. You know yeah. what I mean? And they're, yeah. not, they're not interested in the fact that it was created by one person in their bedroom. But I do think it, the content it's allowing it to produce and the variety of stuff and the weird left field stuff that we're going to see is going to be brilliant because... You know, um, I'm sure when you talk to Dave, he's got some great ideas about stuff. Uh, as have I. I've tried to get them made traditionally. There is not the funding to do that. I'm not someone with a a, 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 a family background in the industry. I'm not someone who went to the right schools. Um, so I, you get that ceiling of, you know, people that understandably aren't prepared to take a, you know, a half a million pound risk with you or a million pound risk with you. Um, so... These tools now, the limit is my time. It's not the resources, you know, for a hundred dollars, I can generate all day long. Um, so I think you're going to see some really, as well as mainstream stuff adopting it, I think you're going to see some really niche stuff coming out that then breaks through to the mainstream. And also niche stuff that, you know, you won't need a lot of people uh, at, at these massive Hollywood audiences to sustain. If you're one person making things, you need maybe 10,000 people subbing to you or on your Patreon giving you money uh, every month. And you could sit at home and make all the movies you want. You could involve them in the movies you, you're making and say, hey, do you want to be a character in my movie? Where do you think this movie should go? You know, you mm -hmm. could have a really um, uh, sort of symbiotic relationship with your audience where you're sort of ebbing and flowing with them. And they're, they're the producers and the funders. And so... It, we could be in a situation that whole new models have emerged. But like I say, I'm not one of the people who thinks that it, next year Hollywood's dead. I, I'm, I'm not naive. Yeah. Uh, and also, Hollywood has survived television, it survived <laughs> Netflix, it survived PlayStation and computer games. It's not going to go down without fight. There could be a, a way that they cling to IP and use that as their their sort of um, their brokerage. So they become a sort of um, production house that say you can use our IP for your stuff, but you have to you have to pay us vast amounts of money in order <clears> to <throat> do that because mm -hmm. IP is still pretty important. If you look at this, a lot of the popular stuff that people are making with us, it's it's borrowed IP. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. Hollywood will have to adapt, adopt a little bit of AI eventually for some things because it just became too expensive to do the old ways, but. Is there already, you know, like the, the, the Mandalorian series that they were recording, that super crazy screen that simulates everything in CGI? It's insert the AI in there and that's it. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> you save a lot of time. But uh, things are already going to that direction before AI. So it's, I think it's a natural step of, of evolution, right? Uh, you mentioned that you didn't go to, to any schools or any income for family on the area, but you did mention in your website that you were mentored by Ken Russell, which for yeah. me wakes way more important than any school yeah. or any <laughs> any family. Could you tell us about this 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 mentorship relationship? Uh, what what do you think is important the importance of having a mentor, and one thing that you learned from him that you like to share? So in our final year, I studied at Southampton. In our final year, he was a mentor for us. And our final, we shoot on sixteen mil, and he came along and mentored us for those those final films for for about two months. He, he had a look at the script, and he came down to the shoots. And what I liked about Ken, the biggest lesson I learned from Ken was he didn't. He I, I'm going to swear. That's okay. He can bleep me out. He didn't give a shit about what anyone else thought. 
he genuinely did not give a shit about what anyone else thought. The industry, you know, he was he was on a mission to do what he wanted to do and screw everyone else. I mean, when I met him, he was doing he was doing some straight to video stuff and he would sort of been pushed out of the of the the mainstream essentially. But he was doing stuff like he, he made a film called Fall of the Laos of, of Usher and he was shooting on Super 8 insects and making films about insects. I think he would have loved AI, if, <laughs> to be honest with you, because it would give him the ability to do exactly what, what he wanted without tailing to a studio or making cuts or having to bash his head against a wall to get what his arti artistic vision out there. So I, I, I think it's important to have these, you know, I, I think s cinema has become, you know, quite a mainstream thing now because of the costs involved and the risks involved that, that they want steady bets. So they want this IP stuff. They want this, you know, even people like Leach would struggle to get funding now. Uh, and I think you're seeing television like Netflix becoming the area where people are, are happier to take more risks or uh, artistic reads. And I think that's quite sad because there's nothing about turning up to a cinema and not knowing what to expect, you know, uh, that, that you're going to get confused, disturbed, you know, surprised by something rather than have this very rigid, you know, plot pattern and superheroes, which, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm a big Marvel fan, you know, I love superheroes and all that, but I just, uh, I, you know, I like a varied diet, uh, cinematic diet, and I think Ken was always a fighter for um, artistic expression, and I think, you know, AI is a really good way of, of bringing that back, getting that lifeblood back into things, and and saying to people, you don't have to worry about the guys with the money. You don't have to worry about attracting a massive audience. Just do what you feel in your bones and your heart that you want to make. That's true. Great, great words. Yeah, I think one of interesting aspect of AI is that you said there's no gate gatekeepers, right? You don't need to ask totally. for authorization. You don't need to ask for money. And I think again, it truly, yeah, like like do the stuff you believe. Tell the stories you want to tell. Uh, it's not about right the money. It's about the story. It's about yeah. I, I did kind of start to connect with my next question with you, which about like uh, creative machines. So how do you see the relationship between AI and human creativity in general? Do you are you more creative now? Are you less creative? Uh, do you think it uh, how it influenced? It's it's good. It's bad. So what's your view on on the these creative machines that are working with us right now? So I'm certainly more creative. My output has been massively more created. I would have to wait a year, two years to make a short film because of the amount of um, preparation you'd have to do, the cost involved, the planning and all that. It would take me, you know, maybe I could make one every year if I was lucky, every two years if I were bigger, you know, I needed a bit of budget. Um, and it, you were very limited to what you could do. You know, it was small casts. It was... It was um, it was uh, not big budgets, and you had to be very clever about the way you used your budget. Whereas now that that, that canvas has opened up massively, and it's quite um, it's quite intimidating the amount of choice you've got in terms of genre, in terms of style, um, in terms of creative machines. Uh, obviously, there's a concern about craft erosion and losing this um, this this the, these arts that we have at present. You know, these these creative uh, uh, art form that we have and I hope that it will retain traditional cinema in the way that you know photography didn't kill painting and that there'll be a place for it in the future as a as a as an art form mm -hmm. um but I, I think you know there's no point in standing in front of the tide and saying go back there's no point in in in, in you know being thinking up and saying that you know I can stop the tide, I can stop the waves coming. I think it's time to build boats, to be perfectly honest with you. It's, it's time for people to recognize that this is happening. And when I get hit on Twitter by people saying, and they're often people from, you know, uh, uh, artistic backgrounds that, that are under threat. And I, I'm totally understanding of that. My father was a, 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 a an illustrator, trained at the Royal College, you know, draft and could draw perfectly. He was around when, when Photoshop came in. But I don't remember anyone saying, oh, you know, you're to Photoshop people. Oh, they probably did at the time. 
uh, you can't even draw a straight line. You need a computer to draw <laughs> a straight line. Do you know what I mean? That, yeah. That's that's been that's been uh, Da Vinci came up with that, and you're stealing from Da Vinci these notions of you know perspective and all that sort of stuff, or you're stealing from Picasso the fact that you're drawing an abstract. So th- these modern arguments, um, they don't they don't really hold if you look back through the ages progress is is sometimes painful but um certain at certain times progress is inevitable and this is going to happen regardless of what happens legally i'm sure if they say you can only train your old models then people will train their own models you know yeah. I, I, it's not gonna i think some people are looking at oh when they say that it'll all be over and it'll all go back to normal no 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 <laughs> it won't go they'll adapt there is too much um to be gained from this there's far too much to be gained from this and i would say to those people who are critical and are concerned they are in a better position than anyone to use this technology if you are an artist and you use this you're an artist with superpowers if you're a filmmaker and you use this you're a filmmaker with superpowers you know if you know a little bit about after effects or photoshop or this is a a, a playground for you and i'm concerned that there's a lot of people who are going to damage their uh, potential uh, by by sort of being kinking it and saying, you know, the waves will stop. Yeah, 100%, man. And we're seeing more and more of this, like each day. Like um, last month, New York Times was suing uh, OpenAI, and today they, they announced that they are assembling an AI team <laughs> themselves. Yeah. So it's like one month difference and these two things happen, you know. It's quite well, I really like your quote that yeah, it's not time to fight against the tide, but to build your boat. I really like yeah. because you know it again. The wave is is there. Like you can surf it, or you can drown on it, or you can try to swim against it, which will be harder. So I totally <laughs> agree. It's time to to build the boats and prepare, and yeah, just surf it. Right, don't fight against it. I think the other argument people come up with is uh, they say copyright, and uh, they you know a lot of these people like copyright. Uh, to be enforced, and I agree. To you know, copyright has its place and needs to be involved. Living artists perhaps need to be compensated and so on. But what they fail to understand is, if you lock it by copyright, then all that'll happen is people like me and you won't have access to it. It'll be big firms. It'll be Disney. It'll yeah. be you know. It'll be Netflix, and no one else will be able to create in that space because they will not have the right to use it through copyright. So people should be cautious of saying. You know, it's a far more nuanced situation than a lot of people on social media, as always, understand, you know, and there seems to be this sort of doomer versus um, uh, accelerator going on at the moment. And the, the situation is far more nuanced than those two positions uh, uh, represent, really. And we need to have more adult conversations about the impact this is going to have. So we need to, do we need to start building in a ramp? For people to come off you know do we need to start talking about how we reskill and and do we need to start talking about uh, under what conditions this can be used in like you were saying put a tag on it say that it's ai so we're not getting deep fakes that are upsetting people or, or or trying to influence people for nefarious reasons so i think there needs to be a more grown-up argument uh conversation sorry mm-hmm. about the whole thing yeah, Milan also said something interesting about copyrights that like everything comes on the shoulder of something else, right? We are always like being inspired and consuming and like uh, in some way, everything comes from somewhere, right? Of course, there are explicit cases of copyrights which are there, but you know, everything comes from, from somewhere. And just talking about copyrights and Disney, uh, fun fact, yesterday I was watching a review from Apple Vision Pro and uh, they, they have the partnership with Disney, right? So but mm-hmm. if you're watching a Disney movie and you try to do a screenshot, the movie gets dark. You cannot screenshot, which was like, I was really like, really? Like, it was just like, you know, it was even the review from, I think, TechCrunch or something, some like big website, some big influencer. And it was like, and he was even like, you know, piking like, do you want to buy a headset which doesn't allow you to screenshot? like what they're watching and send to your family or to your, you know, it, yeah, it's complicated. And it's foolish because there's, there's ways around it. 
instantly yeah. ways around it. So it, it's just it's just a pointless, annoying, frustrating thing, isn't it? Definitely, definitely, one hundred percent. And it's funny because like most of the people that are outside that didn't play with AI, like they think about AI as something that steals something from someone that you only use it to, you know, do exactly the same thing as Van Gogh or Studio Ghibli or whatever. And I actually see a lot of people developing their own personal style with AI, you know, and I think that's quite beautiful. Will you say you have like a personal style with your AI films? Uh, do you see it as an important thing to have or not? And if you do, do you have any tips for people to develop their own style? Um, I would say at present, I'm still developing a style. And I think one of the beauties of AI is that you don't have to have a personal style if you don't want one. I think personal styles were there as part of a way to say, oh, this is that guy. He does that. Do you want, you know what I mean? So conforming to a genre as a filmmaker would make you more bankable or that would make you more investable because that's what you do and that's how you deliver stuff. So I think we, we're edging towards a stage where you can be a bit more schizophrenic in, in the styles you want. And if you look at people like Kubrick, you know, the stuff that, although there was a a through line, you know, that you could see in, in, in the way that he shot things and he would dance around genres um, and the look of his films would change significantly with film to film. So I think we're, we're we're less limited in that way. But I think if it, if that style is part of your voice, it it it's it's important for you to be true to yourself. So you know, uh, like Wes Anderson or you know these these guys that that's part of their their storytelling voice. And also, it's it's whether it suits the story. You know, does it does it that style help move the story forward? Does that help bring the viewer into the story more? So I think these are the decisions you're making now, but it's, you're no longer tied to being, oh, you're that guy in order to be, you know, to be bankable because you, you don't have to. You can jump around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think every every new or style or something also it kind of it's born mocking up previous styles in some way. Like for example, photography and painting, like you know, photography and landscapes, making portraits and stuff like that, which what the guys were kind of painting. Uh, and also, I think AI kind of started on this, right? Style transfer, Van Gogh, et cetera, et cetera. And then as this maturates, and I can see it already, right? Then the artists, they start to, you know, th there is a new it's kind of new medium or a new technique. And then people are basically replicating old stories or old ways. But then the, art, the, the, the real artist comes and twist it. And it, it even maybe use it to do something totally different that no one even imagine, I think, and that's where the real art is. But so for me uh, personally, I think AI is art. It's just a different kind of art. It's just a new arm of art. But there is, uh, you can do original works using AI as a tool and et cetera, et cetera. And like this uh, nice, nice aunties, I think, do all this bizarre yeah, sushi, crazy grandma stuff. It's like, I think this one example, right? It's like really like, uh, yeah, there's a bit of surrealism, there's a bit of digital art, but you know, it's kind of finding his style, he's finding his audience, but he's kind of doing something new or authentic, which he enjoy and apparently also people are appreciating. So I think, yeah, the, 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 the people will come and they will twist this out or even do stuff that we can even imagine, right? And even like create new aesthetics, new new new, new styles. The same like happened with painting, right? There, yeah, you have a painting, but you can have so many styles. And with time, new and new styles will pop up, which on the beginning you say, no, this is weird. And then three years later say, this is genius, right? So yeah. that we, we saw this story before. Right? So, yeah. So talk a bit about uh, indie versus big studios. So how do you see AI impacting like independent filmmakers versus like large studios? Like, the, the, how do you see the difference or there is any, the, because I, for me, I see there is a big potential for indie and like small, medium producers, right? That basically they just want to tell the stories. And as we know, uh, cinema and shooting is just for a few uh, persons, do money and stuff like that. But uh, how do you see basically AI like impacting like indie versus like large studio? I think there's uh, we're at that point where this could go two ways, couldn't it? it could, we could see a fundamental shift in the way that things are made, in terms of the, 
as I was talking about earlier, about independent filmmakers having that new relationship with their audience and um, making stuff um, bespoke for that audience and not needing uh, big uh, places to deliver that content or to market or package that content. Equally, we could, could see an utter elimination of the artist. You could see AI-generated scripts being turned into AI-generated films. You could see a situation where someone comes in and goes, "I want to see X film uh, by you know by this director with this sort of stuff," and the AI totally generates it from scratch uh, in a distant future. And so, I think there's that, that those two ways it could go. I'm hopeful that it's going to be somewhere in the middle. <laughs> And that there'll be a a sort of market for both, because even if it does become fully AI, which I'm sure a lot of the studios would love, you know, a a executive sign off a script and then it it goes down the AI pipeline, they run it through their massive impressive servers, and it's delivered. Uh, I, I'm, you know, we still we still. Uh, watch human beings compete in athletic games even though you could get robots that could smash those records they could, they could lift far more weight than those that you know human beings they could run faster than those human beings it's not a, about that it's about the human struggle it's about the human element so i'm sure th that we will see this 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 two-pronged thing you know one a sort of mechanized production factory of ai where you're you're trying to get ai involved in the whole process and limit the amount of human input and have the viewer decide where they want it to go. But you will also see this sort of renaissance of the individual artist, the auteur in the truest sense of the, of the word, because they are creating something from scratch. So I think that's the sort of the sort of um the, the future battlefield or balance that's going to be struck. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I agree with you. I think it, it will be a little bit of this this balance thing happening and as you were talking about the future we're getting to the end of our podcast your last uh, questions what is next for for you man what's your so, next project i've got gym 48 coming up um and then i am so i'm working with a guy named marco to uh produce a you know the uh runways 48 hour film competition mm -hmm. so you basically two of you get together where they give you a, a list of objects and we will, locations we will participate as well me and maurice brilliant <laughs> i'll see you with bags under your eyes uh, off on saturday night um and then i have um i've got about three or four projects that i want to make at present everything snowballing with com uh, private client work and the bbc work and all that is it, it, it as you guys know with 50 me i'm talking to developers i spend about an hour a day on meetings and um, so it's difficult but i've always got to remember the whole point of this is that I got into this to make what I wanted to make and I've got to remember to make time for that. So I have got, I've got a cyberpunk film that I want to do. I've got a sort of horror film that's part document, mock documentary. I've got, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm a middle-aged guy now. I've been thinking about movies and IPs for the last 40 years. So I've got a back catalogue. It's not like I'm a young band who've come out with that first album. And they're like, what do we do next? I've I've got reams of stuff, and uh, you know, my days are fulfilled with with making stuff. So yeah, Gem Forty Eight. Uh, I'm always experimenting with stuff. People can check out on uh, Twitter uh, and see my experiments because I love to experiment with the kit. But yeah, next up will probably be the cyberpunk sort of anime stool, and then the thing after that, the perhaps the horror. Um, and I haven't I haven't made a trailer yet, you know. <laughs> Everyone's made trailers and I haven't. <laughs> I've, I've made little shorts and little bits and bobs. I haven't made a trailer. So I should at some point make a trailer for, I've got scripts uh, like every uh, every filmmaker has. I've got scripts in my cupboard and I should make a trailer of one of them um, to, to sort of showcase. Cool. Yeah, just, uh, Butcher's Brain, I think he's doing great uh, trailers. I think one of the best oh, yeah, Clark, I saw so yeah. far. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I was really impressed. Uh, Ogun, I think, uh, was uh, like... I also we, we want to have in the podcast at some point. Yeah, I think he's doing amazing uh, work with trailers, and yeah, also sometimes yeah, even doesn't feel like AI to be honest. And... So like Abel, uh, Butcher's Brain, 
visible, maker, Christian. There's lots of us. Uh, Jeff synthesized mm-hmm. in a group called uh, Visible Makers, mm-hmm. and we regularly talk to each other and share uh, stuff. And uh, and a bunch of recent join as well. So yeah, it's good. To, it's quite a lonely thing to to do by yourself. So it's great to have this this wider community of X, but also a little mini community where we can we can prop each other up because it could be quite a lonely experience. Yeah, making yeah, stuff but... by yourself. I'm meeting so many nice people on this community, right? Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's on Twitter or stuff. That's also why we wanted to do the podcast to, so, you know, have a decent one hour conversation because I know there's so much to dig. There's so much to talk, right? Uh, you're just exchanging tweets and likes and reposts. So it's being really, really nice. Uh, and also reading many stories of people. Yeah, I was like not creative anymore. Now I'm super creative again. It brought me back to life. Or I was depressed, and now I'm really like motivated to create art, and I see more and more of these stories, which I think again is not just it's is a, the community is very important layer of what we are doing here and sharing learning, sharing problems, sharing skills, and again I think maybe we can try to do some some Twitter space or something with these visible makers to have like more talk as well, and also we want to have Jeff uh, here as well. He's also supporting a lot of the the project, so shout out to, to Jeff. We want to have this this talks to you as well. So, man, you you're early adopter uh, of this, I would say. So, uh, what advice would you give to any people that maybe it's already storyteller or not? Uh, which is which advice you would give to an aspiring filmmaker and start an interest in starting to play with AI? I'd say get yourself a mid journey account. It'll be the cheapest one and start storyboarding some of your ideas, and that'll get you used to prompting. That'll get used to uh, playing with AI and then get into Runway or um, or Pika Labs because they're great ways into then animating your ideas. And then that will open the world up to, you know, Stable Diffusion, Control Net and all the homebrew stuff that's going on as well. But I think it's important that people coming into the space now is quite overwhelming. You know, there's a lot going on. And I think that you have to have quite a narrow focus when you come in. Start with Mid Journey, because for me, that's, or Leonardo, actually, that's very good as well. I would say they're the two two of my favorite image generators. And Leonardo's got the motion built into it as well. And there's a free account. So choose one of those, get used to creating images, and then move on to animating. Try, try and do it all at once because you'll probably be overwhelmed and frustrated. Uh, and that's not a good position, you know. Start as start quite slowly and build up. Great, yeah, it can be definitely overwhelming. I, I feel that. Uh, I think we all feel that. And yeah, it's important to have focus, right? So, man, thank thank you very much uh, again for your time, uh, for your your being here with us. We know it's busy. We have our normal works and family and everything. So, thank you. We really appreciate your time. We really enjoyed this conversation. And yeah, it's your last words time. The mic is yours. Anything you want to share, your socials, of course, we will put everything in the description, but the mic is yours. Uh, anything you want to share with us? It's been a pleasure talking to you. I think it's important that we have all of these spaces that people are able to have intelligent, nuanced conversations, like you say, rather than just quick tweets about stuff. And we start to talk about where this is going and try and shape the water, uh, uh, you know, be involved in where this is going rather than just let it wash over us. Um, and I'd like to thank you for your support of the community. Uh, the website's great, and I'd advise people to go and check it out. Thank you very, very much, man. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have you here. And we like to end our episodes with a quote from someone that inspired us. This, this, the one from today is from Maya Angelou, and it says. You can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. And I think that's beautiful. Great yeah. quote. Maybe we can finish. We are, we are trying to finish every episode with some inspiring quotes to let people thinking where they press stop or when the episode ends. So yeah, thanks once again and see you next time. <laughs>